it's so good for all you guys to be here. It's, um, I'm going to be talking from my book, Strategies um, for Impossible Battles, and we're going to be looking at a strategy that went along with the, um, when the baby had open heart surgery, and everything looked like it wasn't working. And there was a place in there where um, one of the, the doctors or nurses or somebody in charge, not the major in charge person, basically didn't want to let the baby come home. And they were holding up the baby coming home. And, um, and they were almost doing it in the, in the wrong spirit. And so, and they kept cursing the situation with things they were saying. And so the strategy is bless those who curse you. And we're not going to talk about the strategy tonight, so you'll have to come to one of the workshops for that. But what I want to share on this testimony part from our um, online series that we're going to be doing that goes along with the book, Strategies for Impossible Battles, is the testimony that I put with this chapter has to do with the first time I learned that strategy of bless those who curse you. And so um, but I want to start by looking at some things that are going to be coming up in um, the apostolic move of God that's coming, the restoration of the apostolic. And I've been really studying this um, in the book of Acts, and most of you have heard about it, but I'm just going to read this to you because I want you to see how serious it is when people, the counterfeit of cursing um, someone that's not a judgment from God is, is using witchcraft to kill people or witchcraft to really hurt people. And so if you really start looking into the book of Acts, it's amazing some of the things in there that's going to come with the apostolic. And so I want to look at um, what the real looks like. So in Acts 5.1, a man named Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, sold their farm. Now they were selling their farm because another, they're elders in this church and there was another um, elder in this church, which means somebody who's mature and walks with God and the church knows them and they know the Holy Spirit. And so these are mature believers. And so they sold a piece of land and they gave all the money from the sale of that land. Um, they laid it at the apostles' feet to give out to people who had needs. And so now Ananias and his wife, they decided to sell their farm. Now, this is their extra property. And, but they conspired to keep secret, to secretly keep back for themselves a portion of the proceeds. So when Ananias brought the money to the apostles, it was only a portion of the entire sale. God revealed their secret to Peter, which is amazing in what God's going to be doing. God showed Peter, this isn't, they're telling you this is how much they got for the land, but this, they're, they're lying to you. So he said to him, so Peter says, Ananias, why did you let Satan fill your heart and make you think you could lie to the Holy Spirit? Now that's key in what's going on in this situation. Right now, Holy Spirit is so powerfully working in Peter and these people had no reverent fear of the Lord and they bought a lie from the enemy that God wouldn't know they were doing this. And so... Um, so he goes on, you only pretended to give it all, yet you hid back part of the proceeds from the sale of your property to keep for yourself. Now, this is a really important part to hear here. And this shows that Peter's operating as a true apostle. He's not angry that he didn't get the whole money. He didn't even uh, threaten that you had better give us the whole money. He, so Peter says, before you sold it, wasn't it yours to sell or to keep? And after you sold it, wasn't the money entirely at your disposal? In other words, he's saying, you had no reason to lie to the Holy Spirit. You could have come and said, hey, this is half the sale of our farm. And just so anybody here knows, if you want to sell something, we'll take half. You know, we'll take a tenth, we'll take one percent, whatever. Whatever God tells you to give. So Peter wasn't manipulating and controlling and trying to make him give, which we all have seen happen in, in ministries and churches. But he, he's just seeing it so clear. You pretended to give it all, yet you hid back part of the proceeds from the sale of your property to keep for yourselves. Before you sold it, wasn't it yours to sell and to keep? And after you sold it, wasn't the money entirely at your disposal? How could you plot such a thing in your heart? You haven't lied to people. You've lied to God. Now, we're going to get to a place in the apostolic restoration of the church 
where there's seriously going to be uh, people who have no fear of the Lord and do not realize they're lying to God because God is speaking through true apostles. God is speaking through, when we get uh, more sold out to God and when God really starts pouring out this anointing for the apostolic, it, it, you're going to really be in the presence of God and you need to not take that lightly. So um, he goes on, the moment Ananias heard these words, what words that you just lied to God, he fell over dead. Everyone was terrified when they heard what had happened. Young men came in and removed the body and buried him. Three hours later, his wife came into the room with no clue what had happened to her husband. So we know this was priest's cell phone days. <laughs> Peter said to her, tell me where the two of you paid. Tell me where the two of you, tell me where the two of you paid this amount for the cell phone. In other words, is this what you paid for your land? And she said, yes, that's how much it was. Peter told her, why have you agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? I hear the footsteps of those who buried your husband at the door. They're coming to bury you too. At that moment, she dropped dead at Peter's feet. When the young men came in, she was already dead, so they carried her out and buried her next to her husband. The entire church was seized with a powerful sense of the fear of God, which came over all who heard what had happened. The apostles performed many signs and wonders and miracles among the people. The believers were wonderfully united as they met regularly in the temple courts in the area known as Solomon's Pier. No one dared harm them, for everyone held them in high regard. It says that more and more people believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So how many know this is really missing in the American church? And, and I say that because I'm going to give you an ex a true life testimony of when a leader of a church, I'm not going to use their name, they're no longer alive, and I still not going to use their name but operated in a counterfeit of this and i'm saying that because wow this is what's going to be coming to the church in the apostolic they're going to be people cursing people and they're going to be thinking they're speaking for god so we need that reverent fear of the lord and so in my story, which is a true story, I was, this is years and years and years ago, and it was actually when I was writing my book, Joy Comes in the Morning, and the book um, was just in the place of, um, of me starting to put together, and this particular pastor who was really powerful in the word, but he had a lot of bullying issues, and I've been, um, I encourage everybody to listen to the book on Audible called The Tale of Three Kings, and um, by Who's that by Edwards? Eugene, Eugene Edwards. Eugene Edwards. It's really good. Listen to it or read it. But it's really the guy, it's really good on Audible. The guy who who reads it, they pretty much act it out. It's really good, and it basically talks about are you a, are you the leader like Saul? This man was definitely a leader like Saul. He wanted full control. He didn't want. He was jealous of anybody coming in um, anointed. He was jealous of anybody wanting to hang out with somebody who was anointed, and he wanted to destroy him. And then he also talks about, in that book, The Tale of Three Kings, about David, who refused to touch God's anointing. He just refused to get in the battle. He just left it in God's hands. And then there was Absalom, who was the young, you know, his young son, but who wanted to be king and could persuade everybody and point out all the faults in his father and all these things from bitterness and cause people to follow him. And once again, David chose to not fight him, but to let God be in charge. And so it's really very, very good book to test your heart to see what kind of leader you would be. And I believe as we enter into the apostolic, we'll see this more. But this, this particular pastor of this church um, was a small church, but it probably had a couple hundred people. And he seriously had that control issue. He really did not want anyone anointed that he couldn't control to be in his church. Actually, you were forbidden to have Bible studies at your home. And, um, and uh, it was so ridiculous that, honestly, if he or a man that would be one of their elders, because, of course, it, there it could only be men, were not at the women's group. This is no kidding. You were not allowed to 
bring your Bible, talk about the Bible. You could not talk about anything spiritual during women's meetings. And, and I seriously thought they were kidding. And I kind of made fun of it. And I said, well, if Holy Spirit can't come, I can't come because he goes everywhere I go. <laughs> and then Lord rebuked me and said, you know, you just insulted the lady leading this and she's just trying to submit to leadership so call and apologize so I did and they were only allowed to I don't know what they did I didn't go but I think they played games and um, had snacks and they just couldn't talk about anything spiritual and that was a church in the local area connected with a big denomination but we won't go there and most of that churches don't like that so Anyway, so the Lord had sent me to this church because um, I wanted my sons to go to what would be like Christian Boy Scouts, and they had Royal Rangers there. I also had heard this um, pastor. He's a, really a Bible teacher. On a, he's a local Bible. He was a local Bible teacher. And, and honestly, he knew more scripture. I've never seen anyone who could preach like 50 scriptures in a, in a service. And I love the word. So... Um, it wasn't our family church. My husband did not feel led to go there at all. But but I started going there, and that's actually where I met Karen. And um, so everything was fine. The first time I walked into the church, first of all, I, I didn't know anything. I didn't know everybody's rules. I was just led of Holy Spirit. So I walked in, and I prophesied, and I prophesied about somebody was there trying to destroy this pastor and was there spying on him or something like that. And it was really happening and so after I prophesied, the pastor came up and he said, thank you for that because I was being investigated for something and those people were here and God just used you to tell them to leave me alone. And then he said, you could prophesy here anytime you want. Truthfully, guys, I thought we could prophesy anywhere Holy Spirit wanted to prophesy anytime we wanted. I had no idea all these um, tyranny, demonic rules going around to try to control everybody in the, some churches. So anyway, so I had some favor that way. And then the Lord told me to clean the church for free. When the kids were in school, to clean the church for free. And I don't like cleaning things, okay? <laughs> but I did every Thursday morning after Wednesday service. And this wasn't even my church. I went to another church for Sunday and special events. But I would go and, uh, and uh, another a uh, person who came to our Bible study would go and um, and we would vacuum and do the toilet. We'd do the whole thing. We'd clean down the nursery, everything. It took about three hours every Thursday morning. And they didn't pay us a thing. So we humbled ourselves and we did this. So we were there Wednesday nights for a couple of years, I guess. I'm not sure. Maybe not even that long. So I was at a Bible study, and my Bible study I was doing at someone's home. Um, this prophetic woman, a uh, very Pentecostal prophetic woman, came to the meeting. Uh, we invited her, and she prophesied over me that um, there was going to be this very jealous um, leader, and ch a church leader, who was going to call fire down on me from the pulpit and try to kill me. So I'm thinking, okay, this is years ago, you guys. I was probably my mid-30s. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I guess one day I'm going to be so powerful in the things of God that persecution is going to hit me. I had no idea this thing was going to happen like within a, like a week later. So I go to this church on a Wednesday night. I let my boys go to their little Royal Ranger Boy Scout thing. And um, I'm in the church, and the pastor, he, he's got something weird going on, but I'm thinking, and I've been praying for the church and praying that he would really see some of the control issues, that he would get free, because he's such a powerful Bible teacher. And so I'm just praying for him, and I'm kind of believing, you know, God's going to show him. And so he goes, God has shown me something. I'm thinking, oh, good, maybe God showed him. And next thing I know, he's pacing back and forth and truthfully filled with demons. And he says, um, there's someone here. Now, whenever I went somewhere, 
a lot of people would go because I already had a Bible study. We, I don't know how many people, you know, seven to 14 ladies were coming to this Bible study and our kids and, you know, we met all day one, day a week almost. And so some of those people were coming to, um, to the church with me for the Wednesday night. They went to other churches during the Sundays, but they would come. And so we had a, this night we had quite a few people. We probably had a row of maybe 10 people. And so we were like on the third row. We, in that size church, it took like the whole row almost. And so, and I'm like, oh, let's see what he's going to say. You know, God showed him something. And so all of a sudden he's talking about that God showed him that there is a false prophetess in the house and that God gave him a dream, which either the devil gave him a dream or he was just making that up. And from other things I learned, which I'll actually tell you, um, I think he was just making it up. So, um, but he said, um, there's this person here, this false prophetess, and this person has their own Bible study. Well, I was the only one in the church who had a Bible study because no one's allowed to have a Bible study. But since I didn't really go to that church and I had the Bible study before I ever went to that church, I kept the Bible study. And, um, and that Bible study became B.B. Frash's Ministries and then B.B. Frash's Church and the International Ministry and, and everything else. So I'm glad I kept the Bible study, right? So, um, and he goes, and... So everybody now knows it's me. Now I'm like, oh my gosh, he's talking about me. And he goes, and this person, they, criticize, they, they judge everything I say. Well, I wasn't actually judging everything he says, but you can kind of see that Saul personality, like King Saul, <laughs> coming out. And so if, if they like what I say, they shake their head yes. And if they don't like what I say, they don't shake their head yes. And... Just so everybody knows, I'm not trying to critique him. That's kind of my personality. If I'm like, yeah, preach it, I'm going to shake my head. And if it's like Lululand and I don't get it, you're lucky. I'm just sitting there staring at you and not going, what are you talking about? And so and he goes, and all the people they bring in, watch them to see if I'm right or not. So he's kind of losing his mind like King Saul, right? Like he's so jealous or something that, you know, I, I really don't get it. Now, first of all, this, per, this pastor leader never spoke with me. He never called me in and talked to me. He never warned me. Nothing, nothing. So the next thing I know, um, he's telling how this person is going to die in that building that night if this person doesn't come up and bow before them and repent. This really happened. And I'm sitting there kind of in shock, like, okay, I know I was prophesied about this like a week or so ago, but I had no idea. This person was going to edit my book. I cleaned their church. Never said one bad word to me. Last thing I knew, I was almost a hero. And so all of a sudden, something really changed. So I'm like, okay. So I'm like praying. I'm like, okay, Lord, do you want me to go up and just humble myself? just so we can have peace in this place and him and I can talk later? And the Lord said, don't. And I seriously tell you, I can't say that I know that I know it was an angel, but all I can say is something extremely heavy sat on me so that I could not go up. And the Lord said to me, if you go up and bow to that, you will be completely deceived. So I'm sitting there like, okay. And so this person is saying, when I count to three, if you don't get up here, you're going to die. And they're going to carry you out like Ananias and Sapphira. Well, I knew I wasn't going to die because God has an, you know, an angel sitting on my lap and tells me not to go up. So, but this was the part where I learned to bless those who curse you as a spiritual law, as a strategy when you're doing warfare and people are cursing your situation or or people are cursing you when they're driving their cars and they don't like the way you're driving. And this is really powerful. And I never knew this before, but God showed me this that night. So um, that's why I put this story in this chapter. And um, so anyway, so all of a sudden he starts cursing me that I'm going to die. And you guys, I could actually feel demons hitting me, like really all around me hitting me. 
And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, Lord, what do I do? And he says, bless him. And so I was like, okay. And I'm sitting there, Lord, bless him with deliverance. Lord, open his eyes, bless him, Lord, so that he can get free from this. And I just started whispering all these to bless him. The minute I started to bless him, it's the demons could not touch me, couldn't touch me. And that's how I really learned this spiritual law, this strategy of warfare, that you bless those who are cursing you. You seriously do it. You do it in faith. You don't do it with your head. You do it from your heart and a revelation from the Holy Spirit. So, so you saw that I stopped. So do you want to, you know I didn't die because I'm sitting here, right? So how many want to hear the rest of the story? Okay, so I'll tell you the rest of the story. So he's like, so he's like, okay, no more warnings. And he, and he says, I'm counting to three. And this is it. You have to be up here and bow down by three. So he's like, one, before the demons were hitting me, now they couldn't. Two, and, I, and the Lord's like, stare, stare him down. Because I'm staring at demons. I'm not staring at a human being. He's not, this man's not even operating a sound mind. So I'm just staring him down, like looking him straight in the face. And I'm pretty sure anybody who went to that church on a regular basis knew he was talking about me. But if you were knew there was something you didn't know. And so I'm staring him down, and he's walking this way and walking this way, and he's pacing back and forth. And he counts to three, and I'm still alive. So then he goes, oh, you'll know them by the fruit. And I'm not kidding you. This man, one of the main reasons I went to that church was, of course, I wanted my sons in a, in a Royal Ranger program. But I love that he could go over so many scriptures in an hour. Like I never saw anybody who, just personally who had the scriptures memorized, who they came out of his mouth and could put it together. It was amazing. And all of a sudden, this man who... Just said, by the fruit, you'll know them. Well, just so you know, we had Bible study that morning, and I was preaching out of um, uh, the scriptures on uh, Colossians or Ephesians, but I was speaking about the love of God. So all morning, I was sharing with these ladies about God and his great love for us and how we're to love and how we're to forgive. And that's, that's what I preached on for uh, at least an hour or two that morning. So out of his mouth, I'm not making this up, okay, because I'm telling you, it's sad what happened because this man... Um, had he dealt with the Saul in his heart, had he dealt with the jealousy in his heart and gotten healed in the brokenhearted places, whatever was going on, um, he could have been a really powerful um, Bible teacher. He was one, seriously one of the best ones ever on, in, in, on the, in the Hampton Roads. Instead, he starts talking. And he's never done this before. For the next, I don't know, 40 minutes or something, all he could talk about was dog poo, was dog poo, and snails or slugs. He couldn't talk about anything else. No matter what he talked about, <laughs> he ended up talking about he stepped in some dog mess, or he ended up talking about these slugs that were in the, He couldn't stop. How many know God is very powerful? How many know we don't have to worry about anything? God can have this man demonstrate to everybody there, you'll know them by the fruit. He can't talk about anything. Seriously, for the next, he kept trying. He would try to go to scriptures that would come back to that. And, and I was sitting there thinking, and the Lord says to me, you'll know them by the fruit. So after the service was over and I was alive, I, I just have to say this, and there's probably people who were there who might hear this, especially if they get the book and come here and watch this or they hear it on the radio. But... All of a sudden, this was so spiritual. Sometimes God really opens my eyes and the sermon. I can really feel and see what's going on in the spirit realm. And I don't know if other people could see it or feel it. But as he was saying all this and going into this terrible talk about dog poo and snails, uh, slugs actually, I um, the people were laughing at everything. And it was this really strange laugh. And they were acting like they were so... And, and twi you know, just inter just entertained by what was going on. It was so strange. It was just this really demonic kind of laughing going on. And that really grieved me. I thought. So it is important to be at a church where the person is led by the Holy Spirit, especially as we get more and more into the end times and more and more of power is going to be seen. And so he, um, 
so I left. So I went outside. I'm still pretty shook up, just so you know, okay? I'm pretty shook up. I couldn't believe this happened. Um, I mean, me and this pastor were just friends a week ago, like he was going to edit my book. And, um, and I'm still cleaning the place. So I was, like, shocked. He never said my name, but everybody knew who he was talking about because I was the only one who had a Bible study. And I was the only one who brought 10 friends with me on that night and there was no question. Everybody knew who he was talking about. So when I went to my car, I'm pretty shook up, and my sons come out, and they run up to me and go, did the false prophetess die? Did the false prophetess die? They're telling them in Sunday school, these young kids, that um, an Ananias kind of thing was going to happen in that church that night in a counterfeit. I, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. This was so planned. So I told my sons, no, and she wasn't false. I'd be glad she's not dead. So, so I drove home, and I dropped them off, but I went on to a friend's house because I didn't want to go in the house. This y'all, Anyone who knows me know I have to talk things through. Like, like I just, I'm better about it now, but I'm really somebody who talks things through. So I'm like, let me go to some of the, my friend's um, houses who, were, who was at that meeting when that was prophesied over me. So I went to somebody's house, and God already had this little few ladies from that Bible study who were waiting for me to come, and so we was working out, I was working out, and working it out, and so I got to a place where, okay, I'll go home, and so the next morning, the Lord wakes me up, and he says, okay, go clean the church. I'm like, God, I can't go back and clean that church. He tried to kill me last night. The Lord said, I said, go back and clean the church, so I called the other person who cleaned the church and they said, are you you're willing to go back and clean the church? And they were like, yeah, if you want to. Oh, you guys, I was thinking, oh, God, please. Now, this particular pastor never got up early, especially after a, a church service, like on a Wednesday night service. He wouldn't get up on Thursday, you know, until almost noon. And it was kind of his day off. I think he didn't come into the church that day till late. But it's, this was a family, totally a family-run church. Like everybody on the board, everybody who taught, they were all family members like his son and his daughter-in-law and his, I think his daughter and his wife and him, I think they did pretty much everything. And then a few other people. I mean, Karen sang on the worship team there and really knew about this intimidation and stuff. So I go, it's so hilarious. So I drive up. You should have seen their faces. Like when I walked up, you should have seen their faces. They could not believe I got there. They got on their phone so fast to call and wake him up. And I'm like, oh God, I'm thinking, oh God, please, Please, God, don't let him come in here and cuss at me or yell at me or why do you have me here, God? So I'm cleaning faster than I've ever, ever cleaned in my life. Like you talk about speed cleaning. I'm like cleaning really fast. I remember I had to go into the, um, the men's bathroom or even the pastor's bathroom and I'm thinking, oh, God, please don't have him come in here. You know, they, the guys have those things on the wall that ladies' bathrooms don't have and I'm thinking, don't make me be in here cleaning this in the men's bathroom and he come in yelling at me and I'm like, oh, I'm almost crying. Like, God, get me out of here. And so I'm cleaning really fast. I'm not kidding. I finally cleaned that last and I'm heading to the car. I get in my car and, and my friend with me, we, we drove together. We get in the car. As we're driving out the driveway, he is speeding in in his little race, little, little sports car. Like, I mean, burning rubber to get in there. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm out of there. So I'm like, oh, thank you, God. So I'm thinking, that's it, God, that's it. So that Friday night, there was a wedding shower for his um, daughter-in-law to be. And I really liked her, and, and I really, you know, would have gone. I already had a gift and everything. So I wrote her, and I said, I don't want it to be, I don't want to take away the focus from you and what you're celebrating. So as much as I would love to come and celebrate, um, you know, your, your, your upcoming wedding, I'm just going to send a gift with someone else. And I sent the gift. Well, the next day was Saturday, and they almost had no social events at this church, but this was their once-a-year church picnic. But this particular pastor never went to anything social, never just wasn't his thing so the Lord tells me I want you to go to the picnic and I'm like Lord now at that time somebody we knew um 
husband was like an elder there and was told to follow me everywhere I went if I showed up and to throw me out if I talked anything bad about the church or the pastor. So I show up and I didn't really overly notice that this person was following me around, but I had so much Holy Spirit presence on me and glory that everywhere I went, I talked about Jesus. Everywhere I went, I prayed for people. I talked about Jesus. It was just so much grace. And I found out later from this person's wife that their husband came home so impressed with me. Like, you know, I never knew anything about her, but all I could say is she all she talked about was Jesus. I mean, Jesus and Jesus, the whole thing, all she talked about was Jesus. Not one word against the church, not one word against the pastor, not one word about what happened, just talked about Jesus. And um, so that's kind of cool, you know. So these are all those things, as I'm listening to that book I recently listened to, on the, it's called The Tale of Three Kings, T-A-L-E of Three Kings. Um, I really see that, you know, God will put people in your life to check your heart. Are you going to become like them or are you going to do it God's way? And so um, I know I'm saying I've always done everything right. I have always tried to obey. And so if I did it right, it wasn't because I was in agreement with doing it that way. It's because I'm going to obey God until it becomes real in my life. And so I'm doing what God wants. So we finally get to Sunday. Now, I don't even go to that church on Sunday. And none of my friends go to that church. Well, a few of them, but, you know, they were they were there first, so they weren't, they actually were active in that church. So the Lord says to me, I want you to go to that church today. And I'm like, what? D don't bring your sons. John took the boys to, to our church. And he goes, no, I want you to go to that church today. I thought, oh, my gosh, here we go. I'm going to get thrown out again. And, and um, so I'm trying to think if this happened before or after. I can't remember for sure. I, so I went, so I, I, I remember walking up, and I felt so alone. I thought, oh, my gosh, Lord, here I am. He's going to call fire down on me again. He's going to try to kill me again. Now, this is a Sunday morning. There's even more people here. And I remember thinking, God, I'm just all by myself. And the Lord said, no, you're not. Father, Son, Holy Spirit's with you. Angels are with you. Walk through those doors. So I walked through the doors, and the presence of God was so strong. I don't know if it was in there before I got in there, but I'm going to tell you what, it definitely came in when I came in. And the, pa the worship was awesome, the best I've ever heard there. The pastor preached the best message I've ever heard him preach. Not one word against me, not anything about me being there. It was amazing. And I remember thanking God that by blessing him and praying for him, there had been a breakthrough. And I was so excited for the presence of God that was in that place. And as I'm leaving, the Lord says to me, now never come back here again. I'm like, wow. And I got out to my car, and these two people came up. If you want to hear the behind the scenes of what happened, do you want to hear that much, you guys? Okay. So, so what happened was, um, I, I'd been writing my book, and there was this young new convert, convert, whatever you call them, new believer who had been into witchcraft, going to that church. And the Lord had told me, I want you to give her a copy of your rough draft of your book, of your manuscript. And I thought, I'm not giving my manuscript out before it's copyrighted and all that, and I just didn't listen. And I didn't understand why would I give it to her. Okay, so I disobeyed God. So anyway, I just kind of shrubbed it off. I thought that must have just been a bad thought, <laughs> you know. And I think to this day, if she had read that, Holy Spirit would have softened her heart and then the jealous thing in her and the lying, twisting thing in her would not have come against me. So what happened was, like a week before all this happened, I went to a friend's house where the Lord told me, I want you to go to this friend of yours house, and I want you to pray for two people there because they've been asking to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and it's not happening for them. So I want you to go, and when you pray for them, I'm going to baptize them in the Holy Spirit. 
So I called this friend. I said, look, this may sound a little strange because I know I don't have to be there to see them baptized in the Holy Spirit. But God told me if I come, he'll baptize them in the Holy Spirit. And so there were, they, were like, they were like, oh, yeah, they're actually praying for that. So come on over. So I get there. They're all hungry for God. One's a new believer, and he's so hungry for God. He's so excited about God. He's had a call on his life. And, um, and so we're praying, and both they get baptized in the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues, especially the young guy who, who's really new um, to the whole God thing. Well, his wife was very mature. She was a new believer, too. And she had this life already planned out for her and her husband, and they were going to buy a farm, and they were going to have all these children, and she was going to homeschool. And that was her vision. I don't know if it happened or not. I don't, I've never, I don't think they live around here or anything anymore. I think they moved away real soon. But he came up to me, this young, just on fire for the Lord guy, young guy, and he says, he says, what do you think God's going to do with me? What do you think God's going to do with me? Now, his wife overheard only part of the conversation. And I don't know how many lot of people know Rodney Howard Brown. Well, his brother, um, what's his brother's name? Um, anyway, I, I knew his brother. I think it's, anyway, I think it's Howard. But anyway, so I had met his brother, and I talked to his brother and his, his brother's wife, um, and their kids actually came to John, to see John and I one time at our house. And they lived in a Winnebago. They actually traveled around and lived in a Winnebago. They were from South Africa. And so I'm talking to this young guy, and I'm like, well, you never know what God's going to do. But for example, we had some people at our house who were from South Africa who sold everything and traveled around in Winnebago. So the wife only hears sell everything and travel around in a Winnebago. So she's thinking I'm prophesying that to her husband, which if God wanted me to, I would. But that's not at all what was happening. So instead of her talking to her husband about it, she gets on the phone and starts calling all these people, but she calls the one person who was into witchcraft that needs some deliverance, and that person went straight to the pastor and said, Cindy Foster called such and such, these new people in church that just got here, just got saved, and told him he was to sell everything, get a Winnebago, and, and go out to vandalism. Okay, did anybody call me? Did anybody ask him? If, no, nothing. The thing just took off. So where this pastor wouldn't say what really happened, he just said, I had a dream and blah, blah, blah. Well, what really happened is he heard this girl say something and he hyper-spiritualized it. And um, I'm not saying he didn't have a dream, but I don't think he had a dream. That's not why he did this. So this young couple come up to me after church and they said, Cindy, we're so sorry what happened to you. We went to the pastor right after the service Wednesday night, and we told him the real story. We told him that's not what happened. And he told us, don't tell anyone. So I didn't, so after that, Lord told me not to go back to the church. So how many know I didn't? Um, the, and I didn't curse the church. I didn't curse him. I just blessed him. I blessed everything. The church went in total deception, and then the church went down to almost no people. Right now, I don't know if it's a church there. If it is, it's not a church any longer of that denomination. Um, after my book came out, it was the first time I ran into this pastor at another church. It was some kind of special meeting. And I ran up to him. God told me very much. I ran up to him, told him I forgave him, and handed him my book. And all he said was, well, I hope we'll meet in heaven one day. I said, well, I'll be there one day. And then he got cancer and died. And his children got divorced, I don't know, and his wife ended up dying. Now, I never cursed anybody. Um, but I'm telling you this because that's where I learned to bless those who curse you. And then when I look at this, as God's doing this, giving me this teaching on apostolic power, you're going to see a lot more examples like Ananias and Sapphira when you really get into the book of Acts. And I never want to be part of doing those. So I just want to pray right now. Lord Jesus, if I've ever released a curse, ever, 
for any reason. And it wasn't something you released through me for somebody's salvation. Because he says you can turn them over to Satan so their soul could get saved. And I have been led by God to do that. But Lord, if I've ever done that, and I'm thinking of one particular situation, Lord, I ask you to forgive me and I break the power of that. I cancel any assignment that would be released from any wrong spirit. And I speak blessing. And I do pray for that person's salvation that they turn back to you. So Lord, as we, your church, goes into this deeper walk in Christ Jesus, where we ask you to get all of the jealousy, all of false doctrine, everything of feeling superior, being critical or judgmental, where we ask you to get it out of our hearts or that we would never be those who would curse anyone, but Lord, that we would be those who could be so yielded to the Holy Spirit for your purposes and your glory that your power would be released through us. And we ask that in Jesus' name, amen.